a talk on beginnings and endings, uh, specifically in nonfiction writing. I think that when we approach nonfiction, and how many of us out there write nonfiction? Yeah, yeah, a lot of you. Um, sometimes uh, we, we forget that it's a literary art. Um, so we forget that like the other literary arts, poetry and fiction, we need to spend some time thinking about language, the words that we choose and how the words that we choose convey meaning. And we also forget that we have to spend some time thinking about um, character, plot development, tone, scene setting. I find all too often um, as a professor of writing that my students are so involved with turning their essays into race cars that are carrying facts, right? So they just want to hurry out of the, um, hurry from the starting line and get to the finish line as soon as they can, right? Carrying their bundle of facts along, you know? Uh, like a backpack full of everything that's happened. And so they think that the art of nonfiction writing or the art of essay writing is simply having a story to tell and telling it, right? So, so often we get beginnings that um, do everything that, you know, Columbia School of Journalism is telling you to do, right? Uh, who, what, when, where, how, why, right? Uh, when, when I was 12 years old, I lived in Vermont with my father who taught me how to trout fish. Okay, I'm already bored, right? I'm already seriously bored. Um, why am I bored? Well, because I know what kind of essay it's going to be. I know it's going to be an essay about someone who comes to learn an important fact about life through fishing with their you know, father or grandfather. Um, it's a story we've read many times, but it's a story that we continue to write because it's an important one. But what makes it good and craftful in some um, essayists' hands and what makes it simply doldrum in others, right? Um, language, literary conventions, art. You have to remember that you're turning your experience into art. Um, Edward uh, talked at the beginning of his talk about um, thinking about ca character, if, am I remembering correctly? <laughs> um, but I think, th uh, you know, remembering who we are at a particular moment in time is the key to unraveling your unfiction, your nonfiction, and thinking about what you're going to put in your backpack to get to the finish line, right? You have to be able to carry more than just the facts. Um, I'm going to read a, a beginning to you. And this is one of my uh, most favorite beginnings in uh, uh, nonfiction writing. And maybe we can play a game of, of guessing and you can tell me if you recognize this piece, of begin, this piece of writing. The center was not holding. It was a country of bankruptcy, notices and public auction announcements and commonplace reports of casual killings and misplaced children and abandoned homes and vandals who misspelled even the four letter words they scrawled. It was a country in which families routinely disappeared, trailing bad checks and repossession papers. Adolescents drifted from city to torn city, sloughing off both the past in the future as snakes shed their skins, children who were never taught and would never now learn the games that had held the society together. People were missing, children were missing, parents were missing. Those left behind filed desultory missing persons reports, then moved on themselves. Okay, that is a great beginning, right? Um, anybody recognize the writer and the essay this comes from? I love playing this game. It's why I paid to take the GRE subject test in literature over and over again, right? <laughs> I, I had to keep matching, you know, I had to keep playing the matchmaker, right? Uh, which reminds me of the fact that 
uh, beginnings are like love affairs, right? Think about it. Uh, why do you pursue someone? Why, do you, why did you pursue your partner, right? There must have been a moment of flirtatiousness, you know? A, a little wink, a little giggle, a little smile, a little offering, um, a little love cadeau or whatever. Um, you, you know, I'm sure there wasn't just a marriage proposal all at once, right? You don't give everything at once, right? So Joan Didion, in this essay, you know, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, gives us a little bit in her beginning, right? She sets it up for us. And she does it with language and tone, right? She sets the tone here. She doesn't tell us everything at once. She doesn't say, oh, in the summer of 1969, I went down to the Height Ashbury District to try to be, you know, a hippie, and they called me an old hippie, and these are the things that I learned. Um, no, she uses language to get us there first, right? So listen to how she's a poet. She uses poetry to craft this beginning, right? All these S sounds, right? Um, even the four-lettered words, they scrawled, disappeared, trailing bad checks, repossession papers, adolescents drifted from city to torn city, sloughing off both the past and the future as snakes shed their skins. Missing people were missing, children were missing, parents were missing. So she's building up uh, this emotion, right? And, and you feel like something's going to happen. Something bad is waiting for you, right? Um, when we break up with someone, I know that's such a juvenile term, okay? When someone leaves us, divorces us, gets out of our life, um, we're kind of troubled, right? We're not okay with that. Things aren't okay. We need time to uh, think about what happened, time to realign our lives. And I think that good endings do similar work. We shouldn't ever be okay with an ending. An ending should tug at us. An ending should be emotional. We should keep coming back to that ending, wondering what it means, what just happened. It should trouble, it should puzzle, right? Um, and I think Joan Didion uh, does a good job at the very ending of this essay. Sue Ann's three-year-old Michael started a fire this morning before anyone was up, but Don got it out before much damage was done. Michael burned his arm, though, which is probably why Sue Ann was so jumpy when she happened to see him chewing on a an electric cord. You'll fry like rice, she screamed. The only people around were Don and one of Sue Ann's microbiotic friends and someone who was on his way to a commune in Santa Lucia. And they didn't notice Sue Ann screaming at Michael because they were in the kitchen trying to retrieve some very good Moroccan hatch, hash, which had dropped down through a floorboard damaged in the fire. I read, yeah. I read that ending over and over and over again. It's so puzzling to me. I don't know what happened. What happened to these people? Where are they now? I keep reading it trying to see into the future and I can't see it, right? But what I love is that long sentence at the end where Joan Didion sounds like an exasperated parent. You know, can you believe this scene? That sentence says, you know, it's overextended. I, I need to take several breaths reading it. It's so long. Um, and then I'm going to read you uh, another beginning, which, which it, it's not uh, a good beginning, but it's good for this, this book. I was born in San Francisco, California. I have, in consequence, always preferred living in a temperate climate, but it is difficult on the continent of Europe or even in America to find a temperate climate and live in it. My mother's father was a pioneer. He came to California. In 49, he married my grandmother, who is very fond of music. She was a pupil of Clara Schumann's father. My mother was quite a charming woman named Emily. Blah, 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 blah. Right? Fact, 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 fact. However, um, this is the beginning to, uh, anybody know? It's the beginning to Gertrude Stein's The Autobiography of Alice B. Talkless, right? A book which rips apart the very notion of uh, autobiography, right? So the fact that she plays on the conventions of what typical uh, biographical writing uh, does and looks like is what makes this a powerful uh, beginning for that particular book. Um, 
And I just want to skip to uh, the last part of my talk is about revision. Um, and I think that we need to think about who we are at any particular time in our lives and try to be true to that. Um, I think that writing nonfiction is a messy affair. We should be in the trenches of the mess, as it were, trying to um, make sense of it, yes. But I don't think clarity is a virtue. I think that if you think that you are clear about something, then, then you failed. If you have a tidy ending, you failed. The reader wants to stay at the party and you're cleaning up. You got the vacuum cleaner out. Put it away, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about uh, this Annie Dillard uh, uh, essay, The Death of a Moth, which draws on the moth essay convention, right? Uh, um, and I'll read, uh, the, there's the, the one with the drawing is the original published in Harper's in 1976. You can only find this in Harper's. I'll read the beginning and the ending. I live alone with two cats who sleep on my legs. There is a yellow one and a black one whose name is Small. In the morning, I joke to the black one, do you remember last night? Do you remember? I throw them both out before breakfast so I can eat. The ending. Uh, the very ending. Um, I don't mind living alone. I like eating alone and reading. I don't mind sleeping alone. The only time I mind being alone is when something is funny. Then, when I am laughing at something funny, I wish someone were around. Sometimes I think it is pretty funny I sleep alone. That's an ending I keep going back to, my goodness. And so when I was preparing um, a talk on beginnings and endings, I wanted to talk about this one, but I couldn't find my file, and I came across the version that is now anthologized in her book, The Hurley, Holy Firm. Very different, my God. The beginning. I live on northern Puget Sound in Washington State alone. I have a gold cat who sleeps on my legs. What happened to the black cat? <laughs> and why does the gold cat now have the black cat's name? Bizarre. Okay, the ending of this piece. I have three candles here on the table which I disentangle from the plants and light when visitor, visitors come. The flames move light over everyone's skin, draws light onto the surface of the faces of my friends. Okay, she was alone in the first one, now she has friends over? <laughs> right, so don't trespass on your life. Okay? Uh, I'm not trying to say one essay is better than the other. I prefer the first one. I prefer the first one because it seems uncertain. It still seems lost in the mystery of its mess, of its loss, of its situation, right? The second one feels uh, resolved. It almost feels perfunctory to me, right? And, and I don't think that um, we have a right to trespass on our lives. So when you're writing nonfiction, I believe that you owe it to yourself to try to be that individual that went through that situation. Otherwise, as Joan Didion says, and goodbye to all that, your past selves will wake you up at night wanting to reckon with you. All right, thank you. Thank you.